Hey everyone, it's me, Amber Magnolia Hill from Mythic Medicine, and I'm here to talk a little bit about viral infections and staying well or not, but then treating yourself and your loved ones um, during cold and flu season, which is actually all the time. I tend to think of it as just a winter thing, but of course it's not. People get sick all the time, and the New York Times recently did a piece about... Um, how pandemics tend to happen in spring and summer, actually. So, you know, don't think you're good to go once the cold weather leaves. So I'm going to talk about a number of things here. I have a piece of paper here. Um, I might kind of jump all over the place because being a mom, having kids, my time is so limited. I don't have time to prepare things the way that I would like to and that someday I will. So I'm just doing the best I can, and sometimes it's like, crap shoot and a shit show. I <laughs> think that's what this will be, but I'm going to try my best. So I'm recording this in January of 2018. It is not only the 100 year anniversary of the great flu pandemic of 1918, but it's shaping up to be a really bad flu year this year as well. Um, I read that the strain of flu that's going around is H3N2. doesn't really mean much to me, probably doesn't mean much to you, but um, you know, it's been around before, but the nature of viruses is that they change constantly. They are really smart and constantly um, monitoring the environment and shifting who they are and how they behave in relation to what's going on around them and the um, immunity of their hosts and how their ecological matrices that they live in, matrices, are being um, invaded or used by other species. They're really fucking smart. It's really scary. It's like um, a horror film, really, when you learn about how they work, except that they actually play a really important role in the ecosystem and in all life on Earth. Um, so if you want to know like the big picture on viral life forms and bacterial life forms as well, this is the book to read, Herbal Antivirals by Stephen Harrod Buhner. Um, and then this is also the book to read if you want to know, like, what plants can I use to help treat it? Because Stephen says that plants are much more effective at treating infectious diseases than technological medicine, which right now is, like, failing on a massive scale, especially when it comes to infectious diseases because of antibacterial resistance and because of the way that uh, viruses and bacteria are so smart and they're morphing and they're outsmarting us. They're smarter than us. Uh, I just interviewed Steven on my podcast, so that is at um, mythicmedicine.love slash podcast, or you can find it, it's called Medicine Stories, the podcast, um, on Stitcher or iTunes. So today, first of all, let's talk about prevention. I can't even believe I have to say this, but I really do have to say this. If you are sick, stay home. Stay home. Home. Please. Steven said this during the podcast and I was really glad he did. Uh, I see people, you know, they go, they get massages, they go to yoga, they go to like their classes and things they think are going to make them feel better. And of course I understand if you have a job and a jerk boss or, you know, whatever the policy is that you can get fired, I do. I understand maybe you have to go, but by all means, if you can stay home, please stay home. You are like a weapon. You're a weaponized human when you go out into the world with a virus inside of you. The way viruses spread in, in colds and flus is through um, the mucus. And so they make you sneeze. They make you cough so that you're constantly emitting tiny little baby virus spores out into the air so that they can get into another person's body and take root there. So you are like a deadly weapon when you go out. And if you sneeze or cough, somewhere where a young baby, an immune compromised person, an elderly person is, you could have just completely changed or ended someone's life. Uh, my 96 year old grandma was just in the hospital for a week with the flu and she's just so amazingly strong. So she's recovering, but she might not have, you know, we, we knew that that might be the end, um, but it wasn't. And so stay home whenever you can. And if you have to go out, wash your freaking hands constantly, constantly get the little essential oil spray or whatever, the wipes, the Purell, whatever you have to do when you know that a flu or cold is really going around in a big way. Um, when you cough and sneeze, 
chicken wing. Um, a preschool teacher told me that when I posted a similar video on Instagram. You cough like this, not into your hand, because you do it into your hand, and then you touch it. You touch doorknobs and toilet handles and whatever else out in the world, and that spreads the illness. So these are like the two simplest things you can do for prevention. Um, and then if someone in your home is sick, quarantine them away from the rest of the family. And of course, as I already said, away from the rest of the world. Uh, my 11 year old daughter came back from her dad's house last week with a cold. It wasn't this awful flu, thank God. And I have a 16 month old too. And I was like, mm -mm, you know, we're not getting this baby sick. I don't want to get sick. So she was quarantined in her room for two days. And, you know, I just brought her food, brought her water, brought her tissues, cleaned up the pile of tissues that were on the floor every time I came up. And I know this is impossible with like young children. Obviously, I couldn't do this with my 16 month old. But to the extent that you can, quarantine the person. Um, we know how viruses spread. It's really simple. So if someone stays home, stays in their room, stays apart from everyone else, you can really do a lot towards prevention. Don't be like, whatever, we're all going to get it. There's nothing I can do because you can't do it. We didn't get that cold. We didn't. Um, okay, so also when someone is sick, a lot of rest. Of course, that's that's like the main thing. And if the person doesn't want to eat, don't make them eat. If you're not hungry, don't eat when you're sick. Uh, you know, animals, when they're sick or injured, they stop eating. It's just an intuitive place that they go to because it takes a lot of energy to digest food. And when your body doesn't have to put that energy into digestion, it can put it into healing. So when my 96-year-old grandmother got out of the hospital a few days ago, my uncle, who takes care of her, called me. It was like, okay, they said I have to, you know, be constantly waking her up to make sure she's okay. And I was like, okay, like, I guess I kind of understand that. But especially the first night home, I was like, I really think she just needs some deep rest. Uncle Charlie, like, a week in the hospital where they're constantly poking her and prodding her and waking her up. And there's beeps and other people moaning nearby. And... Oh my gosh, homegirl just needs to rest deeply for at least one night. And so he he listened to me. He decided that that he thought in that that night at least that what I was saying made more sense. And he let her rest all night and she did really start recovering the next day. But he was worried that she didn't want to eat and so I told him what I just said about the animals and and so he stopped forcing her to eat and now she is eating little bits more and more every day. And we just kind of got a I mean, man, rest. And not eating is a part of rest. The body is resting by not eating. It's not having to put all this work into processing the food that you put into it. And it can use that for better purposes when you are so ill and you, you need all the energy you can get. Um, but if you're hungry, then do eat, of course. Like, that's really important. So um, let's talk about symptoms. People, some people seem to have seem to confuse um, suppressing symptoms with treating the infection. They're, they're not the same thing. So an herbalist recently posted on Facebook that uh, she had been to a party over the holidays and there was a guy there, sorry, I took something off my screen here, who um, was infected with the awful flu that's going around, but he really wanted to go to the party. So he took mushrooms like psilocybin, it's like dog mushrooms. And he was feeling great, you know, by the time he got to the party, which is crazy, first of all. You don't want to, like, shroom at parties. It's, you know, really an inward trained thing if you're going to do it correctly. So that's crazy. But also, like, all he did was suppress his symptoms. He, you know, the mushrooms took over his um, sensory system, and he was feeling other things rather than, like, crappy and achy and yucky because of that. But he wasn't better. He just suppressed his symptoms uh, temporarily, and he is still sick, and he's at that party infecting everyone else. WTF. Um, but even something, so obviously most people aren't that dumb, but what a lot of people do do, especially with their children, is give like a fever suppressor, and this is almost always a bad idea. Um, a fever is really important. It's really important. It's, it's uh, upping the core temperature in order to help fight off the infection. And when you give a fever suppressor, you suppress the body's 
ability to fight off the infection via heat, via fever. So you actually drive the infection deeper into the body. Fever is not a problem. Fever is not the enemy. Fever is your friend. Um, so people freak out like, well, I, once they get over 104, I thought I'm supposed to take them to the emergency room to the doctor. I've talked to doctors. I've talked to ER nurses. I've talked to many people who are like, that is not true. That's not a true thing. Like, so sometimes there are, there is an underlying infection that is serious and does need to be treated. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying you never need to treat the underlying infection. Like, um, meningitis is is serious and has to be treated by the doctor at the hospital but for a cold or flu the, 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 fe the fever is not the problem the underlying issue is the problem and the fever is helping most of the time um so i have a thermometer but i, I don't think i've ever used it i don't think i've ever used it i can feel right away when my daughters are warmer than usual and especially with my little nursling right now, you know, her temperature goes up a tiny bit. I just know it right away. And so I just monitor them. I, I watch them. I take care of them. I give them extra fluids. I do things that we'll talk about here today. But I don't freak out about the fever. And I am not constantly checking the thermometer. You know, that's just unnecessary. Um, and of course, there are febrile seizures. Some kids have seizures from the fever. And of course, course the first time it happens you're gonna freak out and go to the doctor I would too but they're like um they're harmless and and parents come to realize that after they get you know empowered and informed as to what happened to their child they know that okay my kid is just prone to these and you will just ride them out at home and figure it out so I'm not saying there's never a moment where a fever doesn't um isn't telling you to go to the doctor but the vast majority of the time it's just a normal part of the immune response and it's a really important part of the immune response. You don't need to run to Rite Aid or whatever and get a fever suppressor. Like, let your child ride that out. It's really important for them. Um, so antibiotics. Antibiotics treat bacterial infections. They do not treat viral infections. The flu is a viral infection and I'm unclear if all colds are viral infections, but certainly most of them are. And there can be secondary bacterial infections when you have a cold or flu, like um, pneumonia or other things that can happen too. But those primary infections, the cold and flu, are viral. So antibiotics don't do anything. You know, when a parent's like, my kid has a cold or a flu, I've got to run in the doctor and get antibiotics, the doctor will prescribe them in order to make you happy. Um, in order to, you know, maintain the illusion that they are all powerful and almighty. I know they don't all have terrible um, intentions like that, but they know that antibiotics don't treat viral infections. They are antibiotics, not antivirals, but they will prescribe them in order to feel effective and to put parents or people's minds at ease. Um, and speaking of the difference between those two things, there's also a difference when you're looking at medicines and herbal medicines between immune boosting, um, components and antiviral or antibacterial components. They're not the same thing. And a lot of people overlap these terms. So an immune boosting herb or medicinal constituent does that. It boosts the immune system. It strengthens the immune system or helps it work better or whatever, and an antiviral component will kill a virus. And actually, a lot of times they don't really kill them. They, like, create a parameter around them. There's different ways they work. This is all so much more complicated than you think it is, than I thought it was before I started looking at the research, mostly via Buner's books. Um, they work in all sorts of different ways, and it's always evolving. So that's just something to keep in mind. Like, it's not the biggest deal ever if you're looking at herbal medicines and you just want something to help with your cold or flu. But they're different things. Something that stimulates the immune system is not necessarily going to um, kill or uh, disable a virus or bacteria. Just something to keep in mind. Um, so some commonly misused or misunderstood herbal treatments when it comes to cold and flu. One is ginger. This is straight out of herbal antivirals. Ginger has to be used fresh if it is going to be antiviral. Powdered ginger doesn't work. Um, ginger tea, a little powder in a bag, isn't going to work. It might help with other things that ginger helps with, like nausea. 
but it's not going to get rid of an infection. But fresh ginger, fresh ginger juice is super powerful. Um, it's one of the main ingredients in our extra potent elderberry elixir because it just, damn, it can really knock infections out, especially if used at first sign. So that that's another thing I want to talk about. Like, okay, we'll get into that. Um, so that's ginger. Echinacea is another one. It's Buner at least says, and I haven't worked with Echinacea much, so this is why I'm referring to him so often, that he doesn't find it to be as strong or as awesome for cold and flu as a lot of people think it is. It's really, um, it's an antibacterial. Maybe it has antiviral components, I'm not sure, but it's more antibacterial. But he really loves it for um, strep throat, which is bacterial infection, and, and the way that it works with that is the tincture actually needs to come in contact with the tissues in the throat. So not just taking a pill. Herbal powders and pill forms really aren't that effective. It's not the time or place for that. But using the tincture form or um, perhaps tea, just any time where the liquid can come in contact with the tissues and you kind of, you know, uh, tip your head back and slowly drizzle the liquid down your throat so it's really coming in contact with those tissues. So for me now, I always have um, echinacea on hand in case someone has a um, strep throat or some sort of throat infection. And uh, so the third herb that I want to talk about here that people commonly misuse, it's not really an herb, it's a whole class of foods, um, citrus, mostly oranges, right? Orange juice when you're sick for vitamin C. And, okay, so vitamin C is immune stimulating, again, not antiviral or antibacterial. Uh, that's cool. But from a Western energetic standpoint, when you're looking at herbs, citrus is both cold and damp. Um, it has those effects on the body. And when you're sick, you really want things that are heating and maybe even drying. So, because there's so much mucus coming out and stuff. So, if you pay attention when you, um, when you consume citrus when you're sick, it, it really doesn't feel good. That's always how I felt when people would be like, drink this orange juice, I would, and I'd be like, mm -mm, I don't like it. it. It doesn't feel right. It, um, so it can cause, like, more congestion, and it can just kind of ca cause your body to feel... You need heat, you need dispersion, you need ginger, um, cayenne, and things that really move the blood throughout the body and help heat you at the core. And so citrus is gonna do the opposite of that. And especially if you're just buying like store-bought orange juice, it's just pure sugar. Even um, juice, orange juice, it's mostly sugar, you know? Yeah, it's like good sugar, it's fructose, but it's sugar at its core. And you do not want any sugar when you're getting sick. Um, my understanding is that it really helps to just feed feed the bad bacteria or viruses and I one of the reasons one of the ways I know when I'm getting sick is I start to like intensely crave sugar intensely I'll be like I need this chocolate right now I'm like oh shit I think I'm getting sick um so you know it's just going to deplete the immune system it's just kind of deplete your whole vitality further the more sugar you eat and then once you're sick just don't just don't do it um so let's talk about having things on hand before you get sick and always being prepared. So you want to start taking things, food and medicine to help the second that you start to realize you're getting sick. Um, this is, this is really important. A lot of these infections will only respond to plants and to medicines when they're at the very beginning. If it really takes hold and gets deeply rooted in you, yeah, you can take that stuff, but it, it's going to be a lot less effective. Um, and if you're not resting, it's also going to be a lot less effective. So, like, I, I'm really proud of my elderberry elixir, and it sells really well. And I hear from people constantly who say that it got rid of their cold or flu, or they stayed well when everyone around them didn't. But I, I always tell people, if you're not resting while you're taking this, it's not really going to do much. You have to be getting this deep rest throughout this. So have things on hand all the time. I mean, this is really basic, um, especially because, you know, if you just suddenly get really sick or you wake up and you're super sick, you don't want to go out in the world and procure things. You might not even be able to think clearly enough to be like, okay, what do I need? What should I have here right now? 
So the three things that I always have on hand every day of the year are uh, elderberry elixir, this wine that my family and I make is my favorite, Got fresh ginger juice in there, and, and other things. You can um, find more. You're probably watching this on my website. Um, mythicmedicine.love slash shop is where this would be, but a lot of people make elderberry elixirs. None of them make them like we do, but it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be effective in some way. Elderberry elixirs, um, some kind of fire cider, and we don't make fire cider, but a bunch of people do. You can find it on Etsy. You can like search Instagram, just, yeah, you can find yourself some fire cider for sure. So these are two things I would acquire right now. Or make yourself, there's tons of recipes online also for both of these. Elderberry syrup or elixir and fire cider. You can easily make these yourself. Um, and then bone broth is the third thing that I always have on hand. And, and try to be constantly taking throughout the year and throughout my days and weeks because it's so deeply nutritive and immune supporting for the body. And great for kids who are just building their immune systems. So... Elderberry elixir, fire cider, bone broth. I have them all the time. And when we have bone broth made, we tend to make a huge pot of soup and freeze half of it. So we always have like one or two, it would be awesome to have even more frozen bags of soup in the freezer for when we're sick. Because again, you don't want to be cooking. You don't you want to be in bed and you just should be in bed. Um, and then, yeah, a final thought, I just mentioned kids and building their immune systems. If you're pregnant or you want to have kids someday or you know someone who is, breastfeed. It makes a huge difference in their immunity. Uh, it's not only are they getting all the probiotics and good gut bacteria they need for a lifetime of good immunity, but the mother's body and the baby's body are in constant communication as they're nursing. So I'm nursing a 16-month-old right now, and... When she starts to get sick, my body knows it immediately from her mouth on my breast and the sensors in my nipples. And then it goes into my body and my body's like, oh, the baby is getting this specific kind of viral infection right here. And my immune system starts working to create the, uh, the compounds, the antiviral compounds, the immune boosting compounds that she needs. And then she gets it right back through the breast milk. It's amazing. It's a beautiful system. And I mean, I, you know, thank God for formula, it saves lives, but it does not do that. It does not set up a child for a lifetime of um, robust immunity. So I think that's everything. I'm just checking my list right here one last time. Um, I'm going to recommend another book. It's called Prepping for a Pandemic. And I, I just have found it super useful. I think the herbalist's name who wrote it is Kat Ellis. She goes over like the most likely pandemics that will hit. Um, and Buter talks about this in, in our podcast interview. Like um, epidemiologists, the people who study infectious disease, have been saying with increasing um, alarm, <laughs> louder voices over and over that the next pandemic is coming. It's coming. Uh, the CDC says this too. This is this is not like a fringe idea. You know, it's not just the crazy preppers. This is like, it's happening. It's on its way. So her book talks about sort of the most likely um, herbal and bacterial things that will hit and just ways to prepare yourself for them. And, you know, if you're someone, when I've talked about this on Instagram before, I've gotten people writing me being like, I don't want to think about this. And like, I kind of get it. I don't have a ton of patience for that kind of thinking because as uncomfortable as you are envisioning this in the future, you're going to be so much more uncomfortable when it happens and you're not ready. I just, it's that sense of disempowerment that's so crappy. It's, it's really not like looking at something and taking it seriously and learning and preparing that's, that's crappy. It's, it's the disempowerment. So um, one thing that she says in that book and that I, I have read in a lot of other sources too, including reading about the great flu pandemic of 1918, which killed millions and millions and millions of people. This is way worse than the plague. You know, we think about like the plague is this the worst thing that ever happened, but this is the fucking flu. And it was the worst pandemic that has ever hit the earth for the human population, at least. So 
so what, what she says in this book is that when it becomes clear that an infectious disease is becoming pandemic and is spreading worldwide or spreading over vast swaths of land and people, um, governments never admit that. They never come out and say it because they don't want to induce panic. And this happens in every country and like every historical period that we have records for. It's just kind of human nature, I guess. So pay attention yourself. Like, does it feel, does it feel like everyone has this flu? Does it feel like it's growing and getting worse and worse? And then you can just be totally prepared. You know, in that book, she also talks about the idea of a self-imposed reverse quarantine, S-I-R-Q or CIRQ, which is like when a pandemic breaks out, you just stay home. You just stay home with your family and you have enough food and water stocked up and you just don't even expose yourself to what's out there. Um, so I really like the idea of that and, you know, would like to implement that for my own family. Um, but, you know, you can get into all that stuff in her book, Prepping for a Pandemic. It's really great. In the meanwhile, take care of yourself. Don't freaking go out when you're sick or have a cold. If you're really worried about um, catching something, like if I were getting on an airplane during this flu season right now, I would use a mask and I would use the N95 masks. You can find them online. They filter out 95% of particulate matter, that's why they're called that. I first learned about them this last fall when these huge wildfires were happening here in California because the smoke is awful it, and it's super overwhelming and um, so those sold out of all the local stores and we actually, the smoke wasn't too bad here, it was only for a day or two, we had ashes falling in our yard, which has happened before. Um, but the N95 masks are what everyone loves, and it works for particulates from smoke and infectious diseases. So I think you know, and it's something you'd want to have on hand when a big pandemic comes to. Um, okay, I think that's everything. Stock up, elderberry, fire cider, bone broth, or soup. And I think, I think we're done here. 27 minutes, let's be done. You've got things to do. Okay, thanks so much for watching. Stay well. Bye.